Well, good evening and welcome to our service here. Our reading this evening is from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, and we're going to read chapter 4. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe. And so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Thanks be to God for his word. I want to give a special welcome to those not just who are here, but those who are watching this online. Paul here is writing in this epistle, the second epistle to the Corinthians that we have, though we believe that he wrote three, maybe four. The others we don't have. But in this epistle, he bears his soul. He reveals his heart. You see Paul the man, and you see his, his heart in his ministry. I wonder if you picked up in the reading, he tops and tails almost this passage with the little words, we do not lose heart. It's very easy in this day and age to lose heart. Our churches are small or many churches are small and struggling. It seems that certainly in this land and certainly in the West, and not just the West, Christianity is under attack worldwide in a way it hasn't been before. And in this country of, uh, of Britain, a country that was known for its Christian heritage, known as a Christian country, now it seems our authorities, our leaders, and many of our church leaders, tragically, are doing all they can to dismiss the word of God. And Christianity is becoming very much pushed to the fringes. And we know that many of you are watching this in different countries, maybe in situations where you're suffering in a way we're not yet, where the temptation is to give up, to soft pedal, to lose heart because of affliction, because of persecution, because of the activity of the evil one. 
And Paul's writing in a situation, having therefore, he says, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But what ministry is he talking about? And where there's a therefore in the Bible, we need to think, well, what's it there for? What's come before? The Apostle Paul had founded the church. The Lord had sent him to Corinth. And there he'd gone in fear and trembling. We read in Acts that he, he, he was fearful. And the Lord ministered to him and said, Paul, take courage. Don't be afraid. I have many people in this place. And he stayed there for 18 months and the church was established. But it was a church that had major problems. And it was a church where he and the other apostles and the other leaders were attacked. Attacked, accused of, uh, of not being apostles, accused of not having the true gospel. And as he says, false apostles, pseudo apostles, would do what they could to not just discourage him, but to rubbish what he said in his ministry. In chapter one, bearing his soul, he talks about the comfort that the God of all comfort, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, chapter 1, verse 3, comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted. A little bit lower down in chapter, he says in verse 8, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. It's easy to think of the Apostle Paul, that great apostle to the Gentiles, who the Lord used to, to, to pen many of, the, many of the epistles in the New Testament, to found many of the churches. It's easy to think that he had an easy life, and that wherever he went, that was it. But that was not the case. He knew extreme persecution. He knew suffering. And he says here, almost despaired of life itself. Physically, this happened. Indeed, verse 8 of chapter 1, we felt we'd received the sentence of death. I love the buts in scripture. And I always say, or often say when I'm teaching, where there's a but, underline it. Because there's a contrast. That's the one situation. But there's a reason for it, says Paul. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. I won't miss out to the beginning of the next verse. You also must help us by prayer, that, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Brothers and sisters, wherever you are, don't think that you, because you don't have what one would call a frontline ministry, because you're not regularly preaching or teaching, that you don't have a role. We all have prayer. Paul often urged the people he was writing to, pray, pray, because we have an enemy. We have the devil. He will hinder us. There are many opponents, many adversaries. It's never easy. The Lord Jesus didn't say, that the ministry was going to be easy, that standing firm on the word of God was going to be easy. In fact, he said in the upper room, if they listen to you, they'll listen to me. If they persecuted you, they'll persecute me. And that has been the case all down through the history of the church. But he doesn't just say there in verse 1, we do not lose heart. Down in verse 16, so we do not lose heart. This is a chapter, and I hope this evening, or whatever time of day, you're watching and listening to this. If you're being tempted to lose heart, you're discouraged, then I pray and I trust that this will warm your heart, that this will encourage you, that this will strengthen you in the Lord and spur you on. Paul says, first of all, and I've split the first bit, into three P's. First of all, the preaching of the word. Verses 1 and 2. Paul says, we have this ministry by the mercy of God. If we look at the end of chapter 2, and I love this. He's already spoken at that bit. He says, we're the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. 
To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? It's easy for us to feel we're weak. We're not significant, we're not known, we're not celebrities. The world does not know our names, know who we are. But, but, God takes, God uses the nobodies of this world. Those, as he says in chapter 1 of, of 1 Corinthians, those who the world doesn't regard. He uses the weak. He uses the nobodies for his purposes, for his glory. And so Paul saying, who's sufficient? We're not sufficient. But then he goes on to say, we're not like so many. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. Peddlers of God's word. But, it's that but again, isn't it? But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Yes, as he says in 2 um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, when he's saying to his final will and testament before his execution to Timothy, preach the word. He says, but why does he say? Because I charge you in the sight of God and of Christ Jesus through whom he's going to judge the world. There's no other court. There's no other authority. Brothers and sisters, hold on to the word of God. Have confidence in the word of God. Don't be tempted to lose heart and to compromise. The tragedy today is we know the liberal churches and I have the privilege of taking services and preaching in many right across the denominations. We know that they sadly have lost the gospel and have lost the authority of the word of God but God does have his people in them and that's the big encouragement. The one here, the one or two somewhere else and you see that Lord God still has his people in these situations. But many churches that would call themselves evangelical churches are compromising on God's word. They compromise on Genesis chapters 1 to 11 and the historicity. They compromise on other issues to try and not offend the world. There's a dear sister in one of the churches we go to, a little evangelical church, and her favourite expression is, lest we offend. She says that is the the, the problem, the trouble with so many churches. There's a fear of offending man. The only person we should be fearful of offending is our judge, is our creator, is our Lord and Saviour, before whom we're going to have to give account. So Paul says, we've got this ministry by God's mercy. You can't earn mercy. You can't deserve mercy. It's God's prerogative. Salvation is all of the Lord. It's God's mercy. He had mercy on us when we were rebels, when we were alien, when we hated him. We would have had nothing to do with him. He took the initiative. He had mercy on us. And Paul says, not just in salvation, but also in ministry. He's given us, he's given us this responsibility, this great privilege. And because of that, we're not going to lose heart. We've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning. So many churches today take the view, how do we attract young people? How do we get people into the church? In several cases, they've done um, surveys and they've, they've gone around and they've asked people in the neighbourhood, what kind of church would you come to? What shall we do? What will please you? And we dumb down. So many churches refuse to mention the justice of God. That he's a holy God who cannot look on sin and must punish sin. We, they don't mention the wrath of God. Whatever happened to hell, I remember being asked to preach many years ago now on the subject, whatever happened to hell. The person who spoke most about hell was the Lord Jesus. Not surprising, because he knew about it. And most of his warnings about hell were to professing believers, to his wider group of disciples. No, we dare not, we must not try and use what Paul says is cunning, underhanded ways. We daren't tamper with God's word, because it is God's word. 
every word in the, in the original in the original manuscripts it's God breathed men were moved by driven along borne by the Holy Spirit says Peter they spoke from God in the Old Testament how often times do we hear the word of the Lord came and the the, the prophets who, who, who spoke his word were told to write down the very words that God said the word of the Lord came to. The word of the Lord came to. That's the authority that we have. It's not authority in ourselves. We have no right to try and reinterpret, to try and fit contemporary society. The moving sands of time. The waves of, uh, of this opinion, that opinion. All orchestrated, of course, by the arch enemy of Christ. The arch enemy of God. Our arch enemy. The devil. And so Paul says, no, no, we're not doing that. But by the open statement of the truth. That's it, isn't it? It's not my impression, my, my eloquence or otherwise. It's not my jokes. It's not my fancy illustrations. It's not <coughs> drama. It's not music. It's not anything else. It's not entertainment that the Holy Spirit uses. The sword of the Spirit is this book, the Word of God. Our responsibility is just to be faithful, to have confidence in, just to proclaim the word of God. And God's responsibility, if you like, is to, to use that as he wills in the hearts and lives of those he chooses to call to himself. And so Paul says, by the open statement of the truth, we're commending ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. You've got it there. That's why I read 2 Corinthians 2.17. As men commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. That's the preaching of the word. Preaching's in the doldrums. Preaching's watered down. Often now we have sermonettes instead of sermons. It's a case of entertaining. That's not new. Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher of the late 19th century, who was known as the Prince of Preachers, one of his expressions was that he was called to feed the sheep, not to entertain the goats. We must feed the sheep, not entertain the goats. Paul, of course, writing to the Corinthians earlier, he says, one sows, I came to you with the gospel. Another one waters. Apollos came and he taught you and built you up in the word. But we're equal zero, equal nothing. It's God who gives the increase. That's our confidence. That's the confidence in the God. The God whose word is eternal. The God whose word cannot be broken. The God who will draw his people. None of his elect, none of those who Jesus died for will be lost. We needn't fear that the church is going to die out. It never will. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's not our church. It's not any man or any woman's church. My church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Secondly, the plight of man. His predicament, if you like. Or you could call it the ploy of the devil. Take your pick. But even if our gospel is veiled, he says, verse 3, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God, small g, of this, literally in the Greek, this age rather than this world, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the glory, uh, gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It's easy to get discouraged, to get frustrated. Many of us have, and we have ourselves, family members who have heard the gospel many times and turned their back on it. To them, it makes no sense. They have no interest. You'll have neighbours. You'll have friends. You'll try and witness maybe people you've witnessed to for years and they don't want to know. They don't get it. And often we're tempted to think, well, we've got to try harder. It must be us. It's not. Salvation is of the Lord. Jesus said to Nicodemus, didn't he? The spirit moves where he will. It's like the wind. You don't see it. You see the results. You see the effects. So it is of everyone who is born of the Spirit, born from above. And if they don't get it, Paul says the reason is they've been blinded by Satan. 
I hope we all take Satan seriously. I say that because there are many churches, and there are many evangelical churches, in fact, where the devil's hardly mentioned. And people, if you ask them closely, say, well, we don't really believe in the devil. Well, Jesus certainly did. I'll often say, just start reading Matthew's Gospel. You won't get beyond chapter 4. And you'll find the devil is very real. His greatest trick is to convince people he doesn't exist. And he's done that for so many people. No, says Paul. And when I say says Paul, remember it's God the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul. It's the God of this world. He's blind to the minds of the unbelievers. That's why they don't get it. And notice the gospel is the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Another reference to the deity of Christ. That he is very God. The very son of God. And then he goes on to say, well, what do we do? Here we have the power, the preaching of the word and the power of God. You see, we've had the preaching of the word at the beginning. Unadulterated, not mixed up, not diluted. And we've had the plight of man because of the devil's ploy, the devil's trick, the devil's blinding people. Remember in scripture, we're described as being dead in trespasses and sins. A corpse can't do anything of itself. The initiative has to be creation, has to be the life of God. I love the old Scottish Puritan, Henry Scougal, who described a Christian or salvation as being the life of God in the soul of man. If you're a true Christian today, if you're a believer, you have the life of God in your soul. Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, says we're becoming partakers of the divine nature. And because the Lord Jesus Christ is, is the image, the exact representation, the attributes of God apply to the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what he says, we're not proclaiming ourselves. I often say to people, I hope you don't waste time watching God TV and uh, so many of the other TV programmes most of which are funded by big money, by people who have got big names, and basically they're preaching themselves. They're preaching themselves, and they preach a health, wealth, prosperity gospel. It's all about this world. It's all about do this, and if you send some money to my ministry, then you'll reap tenfold. It used to be tenfold. Sometimes it's a hundredfold now. And the tragedy is when poor people from all around the world send money in, believing that that's the case. That's a deceptive, that's another gospel. And you know what Paul said about if anybody comes to you with another gospel in Galatians chapter 1. Let him be anathema. In other words, you could say, let him rot in hell. Let him be eternally condemned. He says, even if it's an angel from heaven, or even if I come to you, even though I planted the church, even if I come to you, then that will apply to me. That's strong. That's serious. No, he says, we're not preaching ourselves. We preach Christ. There's the old story told of a little churchyard, which over the little porch at the entrance to it, had had the words, we preach Christ crucified. And over the years, the ivy had grown, and it had started off with taking out crucified. Then it took out Christ. And people just left it. And eventually, it took... It, uh, it, took, it just left we preach and it was starting to take away preach we we've lost the gospel we don't know what we are that's a tragic picture of, in a sense of the reality isn't it Paul was emphasised in his first epistle here we preach Christ crucified we uphold Christ and then we get to verse 6 Is it legitimate to have favourite verses? This is one of my favourite verses in scripture. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You see, so many have abandoned creation. The late Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say, And you can pick this up in several of the recordings of his sermons, that the biggest attack 
in the middle, and it came in the middle of the 19th century, was when evolution, because of, uh, uh, of Darwin and Huxley and the rest, shook people's faith, really made people believe you don't need a creator. You do away with the beginning of Genesis. Once you do that, you're basically abandoning God. You see, God didn't say, let there be light. And several million years later, it had come to full intensity. And it was like a long drawn out dawn. And gradually, almost you couldn't notice it. It gradually got light. God's a speaking God. God says, let there be light. And there is light. Each one of us, if we're in Christ, if we're true believers, there was a time when God shone his light in our hearts. When we were born again of his spirit. When we were regenerated. When we were led to repentance and faith. And trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many Christians worry. Especially if you're brought up in a Christian family. Or in a church under the gospel. That they don't know when they were actually converted. I don't. That's one thing I'm looking forward to getting to heaven. To find out when I was actually converted. I know I was baptised and um, joined, accepted into fellowship in the church in my early teens. But I can't tell you when I was actually born again because from the earliest age, I was familiar with the gospel. I was told that I was a sinner and that Jesus came to die and save sinners. And maybe as a, just as a little lad at many times, I said, Lord Jesus, I believe that. I want you to save me. Others, of course, have a more, if you're coming from a non-Christian background, you have a more dramatic conversion in the sense that you can say, you can point to the day or even the time. If you're like me and you don't know exactly, that's not the thing. It's not the time, it's not the place, it's the fact that there's evidence that it's happened, that you know in your heart you love the Lord Jesus, you love his word, you love speaking to him in prayer, you want to be with his people and you love the opportunities to share his word with people. If that's happening, and if you're longing for his coming, and longing to be with him, and you mourn over the sin and the degradation, and the apostasy, the apostasy uh, and the sinfulness of the world around, that's pretty sure evidence that you have the life of God in your soul. So Paul says here, God shone. God turned the light on. God opened our blind eyes to see. God gave us ears to hear his word and to realise it was a message for me. God removed, Ezekiel 36, the heart of stone from our hearts, from our bodies, and gave us a heart of flesh, sensitive to his spirit, wrote his word in our, on, on our hearts. That's the work of God. And Paul says, that's what he's done. And what does he do? He gives the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Notice it's knowledge. God's a speaking God. That's why all the attempts to say you can do evangelism, you don't really need the Bible. You don't have to take the Bible too seriously. Yes, you do. It's the entrance of God's word that gives light. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing what? The preaching of Christ. The Holy Spirit uses the word of God as the sword of the Spirit. And I often say, it's um, what do cats do? If you abbreviate meow, you get mew, M-E-W, which starts with the mind. That's why we preach. That's why we teach God's word. It's our minds, then our emotions, then our wills. That's the way it starts. Any idea that we kind of attract people and try and work on their emotions to get conversions and so on is putting the cart before the horse. It starts with the mind. I say cat's mew. You could say cat with a K. Knowledge. Notice here, God shines in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So knowledge then goes on to our affections, our emotions, our affections, and then our wills. You see the order. Never lose confidence in God's word. But then Paul goes on, and we haven't got time to look at this. Many of you will be familiar with it. If you're not, then I suggest, well, I suggest we all read the rest of this chapter and follow it. 
because Paul then says, this is treasure. We've got this treasure, but it's in jars of clay. We're weak, we're feeble, we perish, we break easily, we're brittle. But he says, why? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And then you get these paradoxes almost, these A on, on the one hand, on the other hand. He says, verse, six, verse 8, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Now he says, <laughs> we're, always, we're always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Paul's looking beyond this life. Paul's looking beyond the afflictions and the persecutions and the trials of sufferings of this world. It's all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So, because of that, because we have that perspective, we don't lose heart. So we're not losing heart because everything's from God. He's given us this ministry. And we don't lose heart because although our outer body is wasting away, verse 16, our inner self is being renewed day by day. And then, I love verse 17. Have you read 2 Corinthians 11? Where Paul just gives a praise of I suspect some of his suffering, the main things. Thrashed. Think scourging. He says, I've been given a severe beating by the Romans several times, by the Jews. Don't misunderstand that. Men died under these beatings. Paul suffered. He'd been shipwrecked. He'd been imprisoned. He'd been stoned and left for dead. He'd been in peril on land and peril at sea. And he says, above all that, it's above all that, there's the care, the pressure of the care for all the churches. And Paul says, look what he says in verse 17, this light momentary affliction. Wow. Lift up your eyes. When we get a heavenly perspective, when we get an eternal perspective, when we get a biblical and a godly perspective, then the perils, the persecutions, the tribulations, the trials of this life, they just get, go into perspective, don't they? In the middle of Romans 8, Paul says much the same thing. He says, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be re revealed, literally in the Greek, revealed in us. Paul says, you see, it's his mind again. I consider, I've decided, I've not gone on my emotions and my feelings. If we go on our emotions, the devil will make sure we lose heart, make sure we despair, make sure we... That's what he wants us to do, is to give up, of course. I'm so glad that Scripture teaches us but we're kept by God's power through faith. And the inheritance, two Peter, uh, 1 Peter 1, is kept by God. It's reserved in heaven. We're kept by God. So Paul says, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So wherever you are, whatever your situation, whether you're in this, this building tonight, or whether unseen by me, you're watching this, wherever, whichever platform you're on, wherever you're watching this in the world, I trust this cheers you up. I trust this encourages you. And if you're not, you don't have this witness of the Holy Spirit. As yet, you haven't responded to the gospel. You haven't recognised that you're a sinner. 
and that you're under God's condemnation and you haven't recognised that there's only salvation in Christ Jesus, then I pray that you will seek the Lord. Ask him to reveal himself to you and in you and show you the Lord Jesus Christ and lead you to repentance and faith so that you can rejoice, so that you will have this hope, the hope that Paul had, the hope that God's people have had all down the ages, facing martyrdom, as many are in the world today, more than at any time in history, but doing it knowing that they have a far better hope, a sure and certain hope in Christ Jesus. Jesus.